Hello, everyone. I thank you all for tuning in today. This is a bit different for me. I miss all of you, and I hope you're keeping busy at home. And I pray God is blessing you in the additional time that you're having with your families. I hope all of you are staying healthy, and just know that we here at Thrive are praying for you. It has been a while since I've been up here, so please bear with me. I hope that you all enjoy the sermon today and that God will speak to you through it. This is the second week of our series on the last words of Jesus Christ. Last week, Judah preached on the words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. I encourage you to go and listen to it if you missed it. You can find it on our Facebook page or on YouTube. Today, we're going back to the Gospel of Luke to listen in on a conversation among the two thieves in Jesus Christ. Luke is the only gospel that tells this story, probably because Luke was not actually there when it happened, and he wasn't even watching from a distance. Luke was a man who came around later, who interviewed the people who were eyewitnesses to everything that happened throughout Jesus' ministry. And he made it his task, or he was tasked, to investigate everything in order to write his gospel letter to a man of high esteem, a Greek man named Theopolis. And Luke probably talked frequently with people such as Jesus' mom, who was close enough to the cross to hear Jesus speak. And she remembered everything she saw and heard as her son was being crucified. He also probably spoke to the Apostle John, or Mary Magdalene, or the aunt of Jesus, and others, witnesses who saw and heard everything that day. And he went on after writing the Gospel of Luke to also write the book of Acts. And these are two books that are great to read in order. He was a physician and a friend and fellow laborer in the Gospel with Paul. So let's read starting in Luke chapter 23, verses 32, 33, and we'll skip over to 39 and 43. It says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. One of the criminals, who is hang, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we deserve our punishment, for we're receiving the consequences of what we did wrong. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's the title of the message today. But let's talk about these men first, these convicted criminals who had received the death penalty for their crimes. The first thief we'll talk about is the one who rejected Jesus. The one who said, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. This person wanted Jesus to take him down from the cross. He wanted to use the power of Jesus for his own purposes at that time. In this case, he didn't like what he was going through. He was unhappy he was on the cross and wanted Jesus to get him out of there. He didn't want to make Jesus Lord of his life, but if Jesus was God, he could be of some use to him. He basically said to Jesus, aren't you God? If you are, then show me. I don't want to be here, and I want you to take me down. It doesn't seem like he had any real intent of recognizing Jesus as Lord. He likely heard of the miracles that Jesus had done, maybe how he fed many people, seemingly out of thin air. Maybe he heard how he healed the sick and even raised the dead. And jot this down in your notes, if you're taking them, that we need to be careful of trying to use God in times of distress without making him Lord. And that's what this man was trying to do. How many of us have done this in our lives, trying to make a bargain with God? God, if you do this for me, then I'll do that. If you fix this situation, then I'll believe in you, then I'll work for you. Make things better, Lord, or different. 
and then I'll obey your commands. Prove yourself the way I want you to, and then I'll obey you. This man who was being punished for his crime was doing the same thing as the people who hung him on the cross. In Luke 23, verses 35 through 37, it says, after Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, it says, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And this man on the cross did not recognize Jesus as Lord. He wanted Jesus for an emergency reason, and that was all. He was in many cases like the crowd of people, as told in John chapter 6, which is earlier in Jesus' ministry. And Jesus has many people following him because they wanted to see him heal people. He then feeds them, over 5,000 men, and that night he walks on water, and then he turns everything upside down. The people went after Jesus. They chased him across the lake to find him, but Jesus found something wrong with their belief. He knows that they're after him because he fed them physical food, not because they believed that he was the Christ. They were interested in following him so they could have all their physical needs met, and they wanted food from heaven which is what Jesus had just given them by dividing up the few loaves of bread and the fish. They were looking for some religious ritual to follow, like what had become of the Jewish faith at that time, which turned into religion without relationship. And his answer for them was this. From John 6, 29, it says, I don't have anything for you to do other than you must believe in him who the Father sent. And then Jesus says something that floors the people and causes many to leave him that day. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm the food you need to be seeking. Not food for your mouths, food for your souls. Not satisfaction for your body. But I want to save you from your sin and give you a new relationship with your heavenly father through me so that you could be eternally fed and be spiritually alive. After a time, as Jesus was explaining who he was, that he was the bread from heaven, the people began to get angry with him. He then said, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert Yet they died. And again, he said this because they were looking for food. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He then steps it up, seeing that he had made them more angry and says this. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. It sounds shocking then, doesn't it? Something crazy that you never hear a pastor say. But Jesus was not actually talking about eating his flesh or drinking his blood, but believing that he was the promised Messiah and following after him as Lord. He is toying with these people and using exaggerated statements to get a rise out of them because he knows their heart. And they got mad at him for saying that he was the Christ. And you could jot this down in your notes, that his true purpose was not just to give people food or to heal the sick, but to save the souls of men from the curse of the law and to take away the sin of the world. 
They wanted an earthly king who would feed them every day and make their lives comfortable, take them away from Roman oppression. And he offered an everlasting solution that people did not want. And the Bible says that many people departed from the faith that day. So relating this to the thief on the cross, he is representative of many people. He was dying in his sin. And he only wanted Jesus to meet his physical need at that time. He wanted to be taken off the cross so he could go on living his life as he had been in the same way that got him on the cross. He didn't understand that Jesus must die and the creator of all had to do this and Jesus was dying for his sins. And because of his unbelief, that day, this man died as a thief, as a man condemned, a man who died in his sin. He didn't want forgiveness. He just wanted to stop being uncomfortable. And I know I've met people like this in my life, people who don't really want Jesus as Lord of their lives, but are in a difficult place and want help, just not on God's terms. Or people who are spiritually hungry, but don't want to give up control of their lives, even if their life is a mess. Now let's move on to the next thief. This man takes offense at the words of the first and defends Jesus. Going back to Luke 23 through 40, or 23 verse 40, it says, This man says, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence of death? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And this man gets it. He knows that he's guilty. He knows that he deserves to be on that cross. He knows that he violated the law and is deserving of his punishment. He starts in the right place with the fear of the Lord, which the Bible says is the beginning of wisdom. And continuing on, he says, remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. He recognizes that Jesus is God and he rightly fears him. And it seems like this thief is puzzled by the other man on the cross and his hateful reaction to Jesus. Think about the differences between these two men. One only wants to use Jesus for his purposes and doesn't think or doesn't want to confess that he did anything wrong. The other knows that he did something wrong and recognizes Jesus as Lord. He's not trying to get something from him. He's not trying to use God, but he recognizes his sin before a holy God. Who, he's humble. And he knows that Jesus shouldn't be on that cross. Because of this that day, this man died as a free man, a man justified by his belief, a man who died to his sin. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. This man made Jesus Lord. He didn't ask Jesus to take away the pain of his suffering for what he did. He knew that his suffering was just. He deserved it. He broke the law and knew that the penalty of breaking the law was death and accepted it and didn't shake his fist at God. He didn't demand Jesus take away his pain as part of his believing on him. All he asked was that Jesus would remember him. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's what it takes. Confessing Jesus as Lord. And then he asked to be remembered. That day, though he went through much suffering and would die on the cross, he became alive in Christ and went with him to paradise to live forever. And this man is in heaven right now in the glorious presence of our Lord and Savior. And all it takes is simple belief. Belief that Jesus is the Son of God and that he lived a sinless life and died for the sins of all humanity. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. And how great is the love that he has for us. He showed us right on the cross by dying even for people who hated him. Like that man on the cross right next to him who wouldn't accept him. So three people died that day on the cross. One criminal died in his sin. 
One criminal died to his sin, and one sinless man died a criminal's death for our sins. And each one of us has broken the law, and we could have been up there with the two thieves. As people who are alive today, we also fall into the two camps. All of us are guilty under the law, and our guilt means that we should be punished. And you may say that you're a good person, but by whose standard? This is something we all need to think about. You could say we're good by the standards of the world, as Judah said last week. And I could say I'm a good person, but by which culture or by which religious system? And the goodness that God recognizes is absolute perfection. And I know I fall short of that standard every day. And it says in James 2.10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And the Bible also says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It means that if you have sinned once in your entire life, you're guilty. It's as if you failed on the whole law because the wages, the payment we get for our sin is death. And that's what sin gets us. It may be what we think is the smallest sin of all. Maybe a white lie or using God's name in vain. Maybe anger at someone for what they have done to you or someone else. Have you ever coveted anything? Someone or something? And I know I've done all these things. And that's enough to condemn us. And if we don't come to Christ, we're judged by the law. And by the law, I stand condemned and without hope. The law has no grace. You could put this in your notes. And the law has no mercy. The law cannot forgive. And the law cannot take away sin. It's like when you hear someone say, there ought to be a law. Be careful thinking like that. Because the law can't have grace. The law can only say that there's a penalty for doing wrong. And when you live your life outside of Christ, this is how we're condemned. And Jesus died for you and Jesus died for me. I'm the thief on the cross. I'm the one who has fallen short of God's standard. But Jesus loves us so much that he paid the penalty for my sins and for yours. Think about what happens when you commit a crime on earth. Let's say you steal something, or you go over the speed limit. You receive a ticket and a summons to court. And while you're in court, someone comes up and offers to pay the fine or go to jail in your place. They offer to take your punishment. And if someone did this, you would be set free. And Jesus Christ took your punishment on the cross. The Bible says that he died to sin once for all. And all you need to do to receive his forgiveness is to accept him as Lord. The Bible says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you will be saved. Saved from the power of sin, saved from the penalty of sin, which is eternal separation from him in a place called hell that was reserved for the devil and his angels a place God never intended humans to go. Jesus died for both of those people who are next to him on the cross that day. The thief on the left and the thief on the right. He paid the penalty for both of their sins equally. And one rejected Jesus and was brought before the judge of all the earth to answer no to the question of having accepted Jesus as the Son of God. And the other accepted Jesus and passed from this life to the next with full forgiveness of his sins. When he stood before the judge of the earth, he answered yes to accepting Jesus as Lord. And his body died, but he lived on spiritually. And we will see this man when we go to heaven. So which thief are you? Do you acknowledge your need for a savior today? In John 3, 16 through 18, it says, For this is how God loved the world. 
He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And some of you may be going through life feeling the weight of your sin and feeling the condemnation from your sin. And Jesus says, come to me and I will take that condemnation. Come to me and I'll forgive you. Come to me and you will be set free. Make me Lord of your life and you will have eternal life. The Bible says that God could set the worst sinner free. It doesn't matter how bad you view your sin. You're not going to get struck by lightning. He could free you from the power of your sin and from the punishment of your sin. And I could tell you I didn't understand salvation for much of my life. I said the sinner's prayer when I was five years old. But I don't feel like I meant what it meant or I knew what it meant to be saved until I was in my mid-30s. That God could and he would break the power of sin in my life. That nothing was too powerful for him to overcome. That he didn't want me to be a slave to sin and that he would give me power over it. That the Holy Spirit would cleanse my heart and make me into a new creation. And like me, some of you may have made a declaration of faith sometime in your life, but don't have full confidence that you have been saved. And if this is you, I would say to go to Jesus again, but make him Lord of your life. Give God control of your life, and you could put that in your notes. Listen to his still small voice and allow him to change you. And we always say here at Thrive to come as you are, and we mean it. Come to church as you are, but don't stay that way. Allow God to work in your life. Get to know him by reading his word. The gospels are a great place to start and study. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Take the 555 challenge. Five minutes of reading, five minutes of praying, and five minutes of listening. But be obedient to the words of Jesus and ask him for help to live life how he would have you. Because not one of us could live rightly before God by the force of our own will. And Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to help us. And as I close today, I want to expand on the last words of Jesus to this man. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Well, what is paradise? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. The Bible says the paradise is like nothing that we had ever seen or nothing we could ever imagine. It is so much better than anything we could ever think. Your best day here on earth has nothing on heaven. Your greatest thought is not even close. And this is the eternal dwelling place for all who believe on him. Because of Jesus, we have hope that can never be taken away. We are made right with the Father through the blood of his Son. And we will be with him in paradise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly today. And Lord, we hear your words and we pray, Lord, that you would have us live the life that we need to live in holiness, Lord, in purity before you. And God, I pray for someone hearing the gospel message today, Lord, that they would not silence the Holy Spirit working in their heart. And if anyone is out there who knows that God is speaking to them now, I would say to cry out, to say, Jesus, 
I believe you are my Lord. And if you do that, give control to him. You will be with him in paradise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything. We pray, God, your safety and your blessing for everyone listening. May your will be done in our lives. And Lord, we look forward to the time we get to be together again. In Jesus' name, amen.